So welcome to the Denture Aesthetics Fundamentals for Fabrication and Photography of Removable Prosthetics. This is part two of a two-part webinar series, and it is being presented by Dr. Miles Cohn. And now I turn the, the reins over to Dennis Urban, CDT. He is our Director of Clinical Education, and he will introduce tonight's guest star. So please feel free to reach out to him with any suggestions or questions around what you would like to learn about in the future. Take it away, Dennis. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm excited about part two of this presentation. I love part one. Was, uh, one hour seemed like five minutes went so fast. And uh, before we get started, I want to introduce Dr. Cohn, though. Uh, Dr. Miles Cohn is a graduate of Tufts University School of Dental Medicine, and he completed a three-year prosthodontic residency program while serving in the United States Army. And in addition to achieve, achieving board certification and diplomat status with his specialty, Dr. Cohn has successfully challenged all the requirements necessary to earn his designation as a certified dental technician. I love to hear this because I'm the chair of the uh, uh, National Board of Certification. So it's great that you're, you're a dental technician. That's fantastic. Thank you. So, very few, we have a, two times we have a dentist and a dental technician. So with the dental technician background, that's great. And currently Dr. Cohn's career in civilian life revolves around his role as the owner of Nuance Dental Specialist. It's a private practice dental clinic limited to prosthetic dentistry in the heart of Portland, Maine and his role as a key opinion leader. And when Dr. Cohn is not at the chair in a classroom teaching or at the lab bench, he can be found lecturing on the international circuit, publishing, publishing in peer reviewed journals and relaxing at home with his wife and four children and two English Bulldogs in Maine. And with that, I wanna introduce Dr. Miles Cohn. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. We look forward to part two of your, pre of your presentation. Hey, thank you so much, Dennis. Hey, thank you very much to NDX Education. Thank you to the great folks at Zest for sponsoring this yet again. Um, this is, yeah, one of my absolute um, most favorite topics to talk about. Uh, that in photography, which of course is what we talked about last time. So now that you guys, for those of you that were here last time, now that you've seen some of the behind the scenes, now we're going to go through a lot of the case studies. This is, again, this is like a really, really fun part. So again, sit back, relax a little bit. Um, if there's anything at the end of these case studies that you want more resolution on, you have some questions on, you want to connect it with me, uh, you want to share with me some of your cases, I'll have all of my contact details up at the very end. So please, please, please um, shoot me your information. I'd love to connect with you and, and hear what you got going on. So let's get right into it. So when we go into this, um, when we're talking about these case studies, I want to just put out some of my thoughts about dentures in general, you know, and it's kind of interesting with my denture patients, at least. And this is one way that I try to set up uh, managing patient expectations is, you know, patients come to me and they, they've got a denture, right? And they, they've got gripes and complaints that it doesn't fit, it doesn't look right, et cetera, right? And that's very, very common. Well, think about this, right? There's a lot of different types of prosthetics. I mean, there's more than just teeth, right? We have patients that lose eyes all the time, right? And so a patient that loses an eye, they never expect to see again with that eye, right? There's no, there's no assumption that they're going to be able to, to see with that eye. And that's just a given. Nobody ever, that's not, that's not up for debate, right? But when people lose teeth, this is a totally different story, right? They expect to have full function again, right? They, what's the first thing they say? I want to be able to eat a steak <laughs> as soon as they get their denture, right? Which of course, like does not happen. Right. And of course, now they want it to look exactly like their old teeth do. But that is such a huge problem. It's not just like, oh, you got like a hole in your skull and you're replacing an eye. Right. Like when you're when you've lost teeth, a lot of times there's a lot of bone that's been resorbed. Right. The old Talgren study. Right. The 25 year studies that talked about the way that the mandible and the maxilla resorbs. Most of our denture patients are now in a class three type situation. So bringing the maxilla out into a class one type relationship is often very, very difficult. It's very, it's very challenging to get your patients to look like what they think they should look like, right? They'll bring you that photograph of themselves. And how big is the photo of their teeth in the photo when they tell you, hey, I want my teeth to look like the way they did when I was 25. Like the size of their head in the, in the photograph is like the size of a quarter, right? And their teeth are like microscopic. You can't see anything in there. But I guarantee you the way that their denture looks and fits today is not the way that their teeth looked before. So as clinicians, as restorative dentists, we have a very challenging road ahead. So when I get into my <laughs> treatment with my patients, this is something that I always try to, to express to them to make very clear that a denture is not a replacement for teeth. A denture is a substitute for not teeth, 
right? It will never operate and function at the same level that their natural teeth always did, even if it's supported by implants, right? Even if they have like a full arch implant case. All right, so let's get into this first case. This is one of my, um, I've been showing this case for probably 10 years. It's still one of my all time favorite cases. Now this is Tran. Tran is the mother-in-law of my periodontist um, that I was with when I was in the military. My periodontist partner that I was with in the military, you, everybody's kind of assigned to a buddy throughout your, throughout your three-year residency. So my periodontist, uh, Dr. Sheldon Liu, this was his mother-in-law. And you know, with the way that Tran's teeth look, you take a look here, and these are like the lowest of the low denture teeth that they used for this. And this is the kind, <laughs> this is the kind of setup that my wife, who again is the practice manager she's not a dentist you know but this is the kind of setup that when we're at the grocery store and the <laughs> the woman or the man checking our checking us out with our groceries has a denture like this and she'll like elbow me in the ribs really hard <laughs> and she'll say that's a denture right and i'm like yeah like that's obviously a denture like it's not even it's not even close right like nobody's teeth especially a 72 year old woman's teeth would never look like this so one of the first things that I'm doing when I'm doing my um, my evaluations is I want to look at the foundation, right? I want to take a look and see what do I have going for me? Is this going to be difficult? Like it's easy to make you know any denture look nice, but getting it to to stay in the mouth is, is another thing, right? So there's always the aesthetic component, and then there's the functional component. So when I take a look at Trans Jaws, she's actually got really really good bone. If you take a look at the upper right photo, you can see that her left maxillary ridge is a little bit more robust. It's a little bit more plump than the right maxillary ridge. That's because she had a stroke on the left side of her head. And I remember asking uh, my buddy about this, my periodontist. I was like, hey, when did your mother-in-law have a stroke? And he's like, dude, how'd you know she had a stroke? <laughs> it's like, bro, you can see from the ridge, it's obvious, you know, like one side has become has atrophied a little bit. And so when I showed this to him, that was the first time that he'd ever seen that, right? Um, so these are all things that we're kind of looking at. Um, I'm taking a look at the saliva in here, right? I want to make sure that she doesn't have like super thick ropey saliva. I want to make sure that she's got um, moist oral environment. Many of these patients, especially at this demographic, um, are taking many medications. Um, xerostomia is a huge, huge issue. And I'm going to tell you a little trip trick later on uh, for getting around that. Um, so with uh, Tran, with her maxillary arch, she's actually pretty good. She doesn't need anything, but for the bottom, the standard of care is to do two, um, two implants on an overdenture. That's generally the standard of care. The American College of Prosthodontists has put this out. That's the way that we follow. Um, every now and then, like one in, I don't know, 25 patients, I'll have to do four implants in the mandible. Usually it's on somebody who's had a partial for a long, long time. And if you think about most of your patients that have partial dentures, what does the rest of their oral environment look like? They've got a maxillary denture. They've got maybe premolar to premolar or premolar to canine. And then they're, they're um, bilaterally edentulous, right? They've got a bilateral distal extension with a knife edge ridge, right? They're, the ridge looks like a razor blade. Don't fall into the trap of thinking you're going to do just two, two implants in the front there on an overdenture. What will happen is because the posterior ridge and the mandible is so resorbed, that denture is going to like want to flop up a little bit. All right. So in those types of situations, I'm usually placing actually four implants. But you can see, I mean, her ridge is like as thick as my finger. It's massive. If she had any more bone, she'd be she'd have acromegaly. <laughs> She's got a lot of bone. This is like an ideal situation. This is like you know, Fisher Price, my first denture. Like this is like the ideal situation. So we put two implants in and we do it in the lateral incisor region. Now, a lot of people try to go to the canine region. You don't want to do that because consider, you know, that most implant overdentures, they are implant retained, but it's still tissue supported. I still need the flange of that mandibular denture to go back and sit on the heels of, of her ridge there, right back where the retromolar pad is. So I want to move the implants as far anterior as possible to kind of distribute that force all the way across. Um, so mo many people put them in the canine region. Every now and then I will. I've got a case at the end that I put them in the canine region. Sometimes I even have to go to the premolar region. It just depends on what the bone looks like. But if you can, try to put them in the lateral incisor region. So here's the here's her implants. This was at like a one-year follow-up. Um, they're doing really, really good. There's been no bone loss or anything around there. Um, and when we do these impressions now, this is the way, again, this is a decade old now. I used to do all of my, um, 
I used to do all of my dentures with silicone. I used to border mold and I used to do the full deal. Truth is though, that's very dogmatic. Many of the papers, much of the literature out there now doesn't support doing that whole five-step process like you were taught in dental school where you make a diagnostic alginate impression, you make a custom tray, you border mold it, you do a, a VPS wash, right? I do that from time to time, but it's really not necessary. Actually, what I do most of the time now is I just use alginate to make my final impression for my maxilla and my mandible, right? Um, but the thing that I wanted to show you about this is, is that when I pour this up, right, I've maintained the retromolar pad. You can see that kind of like almond shaped sort of pad back there. That's back where the third molars were. That's like kind of the scar tissue from the third molars, right? So that retromolar pad, that is the primary area of support for a mandibular denture. That and the external oblique ridge that runs right along the buccal vestibule there, right? So what a lot of technicians do, what a lot of dentists will have their technicians do, is they'll have them trim those heels off, right? Because a lot of times your patients will say, hey, like it feels like there's too much plastic in here. And it is, it is a lot of plastic. And that's something else that I really try to prepare my patients for is that I say, you know, you've had a denture that's been really diminutive. It hasn't had a big flange. This is going to feel like a lot of material for you when you, when you first get this in. So just really try to prepare your patients for that. All right. Because they're not going to be used to it and do not cut off the heels on those dentures. It is really going to make a long, uh, long-term difference. Um, towards the, the long-term prognosis of this because it's going to allow that denture to, to seat really and be very, very stable on the, on the bone and on the tissue. An ill-fitting denture without heels back there on the retromolar pad will re cause that mandible to resorb and it'll, it'll lead to a lot of trouble down the road, trust me. Um, so something that I do um, that is not known to many people, and if you guys get nothing else from this part too, I want you to take this away. Many times when I am making um, my complete dentures, maxilla mandible, most of the time I will do a processed record base for my maxillary arch. So what's a processed record base, right? So when you do your final impression, whether it's silicone, whether it's alginate, whatever it is, when you send that into your laboratory technician, I want you to start putting on your lab script, please process uh, or please fabricate a processed record base for the maxillary arch. I almost never do it for the mandible and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit now. But essentially what a process record base is, is if you imagine when you get that completed denture back from the laboratory and it's finished and polished and looks great and you're ready for delivery, imagine that full denture just minus the teeth, no teeth. And instead of the teeth, it's got a wax rim on there, right? So it's essentially the final denture base, the acrylic, the pink part without the teeth. And the reason why you're gonna do this is, now think about most of your patients that come in that need new denture, right? The denture's flopping around, it's loosey-goosey. Probably the mandible is in the drawer somewhere, they never wear it, right? When you do a processed record base, rather than just like a triad record base, right? Because I used to do that all the time. I'd get like my little triad urethane dimethyl methacrylate. Um, I'd block out all the undercuts on the cast, right? Make that record base, try it in the mouth and it like, like falls in and out. And now you got to put some like denture cream or adhesive, which the patient hates. And it's just like a mess. Now, when you send that back to the laboratory, you got to try to like scrape it out of there with some like orange solvent or something like that. It's just, it's nasty, right? So again, when you make this process record base, you're essentially creating like the basal seat for that denture. So now when you put that in the patient's mouth, it's going to suction cup in there. And it's absolutely fantastic. And your patient will have so much confidence in you when you put that in because they know that this isn't even the final denture yet and oh my gosh this thing like you need a crowbar to pry it out right but the other thing there's one more tip is that if you have missed an area of the vestibule uh the hamular notch the tuberosity if there's some key feature of the palate that you've missed you can always use that process record base to go in and make do a wash pickup impression all right so i'm going to talk about that a little bit later but Process record bases are absolutely fantastic. And what I've got mentioned here about the centric jaw relation, imagine how much more stable this is going to be when you do this, uh, that centric jaw relation record, right? And if we are endeavoring on accuracy and every step in the process is dependent on the one that came before it, it really behooves you to have that CJR record, like really, really accurate when you're doing your bite, right? And how accurate can it really be if that record base is like falling in and out of their mouth, right? If you're just using triad. And so when we start doing the fricatives and the sibilants, right? The 55, 55, 55, 66, 66, right? 
this is really, really difficult to do if that denture base is not, you know, have really, really good suction. So in this photograph here of Tran, when I'm having her go through all of her phonetics, all of the speech sounds, right? This is the teeth set in wax on that final denture base again. And now I can really evaluate, hey, how does this look? How, how, does it, how does it sound in the mouth, right? The phonetics and the aesthetics. And I really, really feel like that this is just, it really combines the best of both worlds. So when we take a look at the final denture now, so this was the record base. This was the process record base um, that we had. And now the teeth have just been, after they were set on there, now they've just been reprocessed to it. So it's kind of like, I don't know, like refried beans or something like they were fried and then they got refried. This base has been processed and then reprocessed a second time. Now your laboratory technician needs to know how to do that because if they like twice bake the um the base that it can warp so there is a, a definite technique to it um so just make sure that they understand what they're doing ahead of time before they do that um so with my um with my teeth and i might have mentioned this to you guys last time you know that i was really into you know evolution and paleontology and things like that so when i have patients that have you know different ethnic backgrounds different um different different areas regions of the world i try to make the teeth look like teeth for somebody that would suit that that individual so for trans teeth here i gave her what we call synodont dentition now what is synodont dentition so i remember i had to go back and look this up you guys had this information in dental school for about like five minutes you guys probably recall hearing about shovel shaped incisors right that that term rings a bell for a lot of people shovel shaped incisors right so when we look at synodont dentition there's a lot of i guess very characteristic features the the one the most common are these shovel shaped incisors sometimes we call them butterfly incisors right where the mesial edge is kind of tilted in and the distal edge is kind of like flared out right we call it call it, we call these wing they're winged incisors right now some of the other features you would never notice on a denture for example a single rooted maxillary first premolar like that's obviously not going to be a thing on a denture same thing with a trifurcated mandibular first molar that wouldn't be a feature of synodontic dentition that you could build into a denture but again it's just interesting when you start like really noticing and paying attention to, to real world teeth um it's amazing how how much of that you can apply to your dentures and how great it looks actually on your patients right and so when i took radiographs of trans daughter turns out she had single rooted uh maxillary first premolars and the trifurcated mandibular first molar she had a full complement of teeth so that was actually kind of cool to see you know to actually see like <laughs> the stuff from the textbooks put into action now on the mandibular prosthesis, one of the things that you'll notice is I've made the, the anterior teeth kind of snaggle tooth and overlapping. I've made some crowding there, right? Because most people have crowding. And I know in the textbooks, you know, they mention all of these things about doing, you know, cross tooth, cross arch, lingualized occlusion, you know, all these things like, I don't do any of that. I make all of my dentures canine guided and the literature supports this. The literature supports that canine guided dentures look better, function better and are easier to set and much of these principles that we learned in dental school again about doing you know lingualized occlusion and, and like zero degree like a lot of it just doesn't add up when you really scratch beneath the surface there's not a lot of science there um one of the other things that i do also do on my dentures is i will often drop a second molar i don't add you know just because you have them on that card of teeth you don't have to use them oftentimes i won't use it because again for many of these patients and many of the folks in my demographic that I'm treating, right, they're these will tend to be older women. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a heck of a lot of, of a lot of teeth. Okay. So I'm either dropping a second molar or possibly I'll drop a premolar and I'll do the two molars. It just depends on the setup. But I don't want that second tooth to start riding up on the heel of the mandibular prosthesis, right? So I want to try to avoid that. And for most patients, you'd never even be able to see, you'd never be able to tell that they had that second molar drop. So at the very end, this is how Tran looked, right? Here's her before, here's her after. And now she's she's feeling really good about herself. So she's changed the color of her makeup, <laughs> right? And uh, she's looking good. She loves the way she looks. But I'll be honest with you, when we, when we first uh, delivered her denture to her, the first thing she said was, and I couldn't understand it, her daughter was there to translate. You know, she said something to me in, uh, in Vietnamese, and I said, you know, what did she, what did your mom say? Does she like it? And she says, well, she thinks she looks like a rabbit. <laughs> and I said, yeah, she kind of does look like a rabbit, you know, considering what she started with. And this is something else that I tell all of my denture patients is I say, you know what, the process of you getting your very first denture, and it's usually been like 20, 25 years up until now, those teeth wear down over time, but the process is so glacial, you don't notice it 
right? And so now I've basically added two to three millimeters of tooth length to your denture like overnight. That's a big change for people, right? Imagine, remember going from, you know, kind of like real baggy jeans to like more form fitting jeans or skinny jeans, how kind of awkward you feel at first or the way that you felt when you went from, uh, you know, like high school, the first time you wore like a tie or like a suit coat and it was like your dad's jacket and it was like a size too big and it had like the shoulder pads. Just remember how uncomfortable you felt in your own skin. Your patients are gonna be like that too with their dentures. So again, I always tell my patients like, hey, when you first see this denture, it's gonna look big, it's gonna feel funny. You're, you're not gonna really like the way that you look, but trust me, I can't send you out this door looking terrible. I wouldn't do you like that, okay? And the thing that I tell my patients all the time is like, hey, just give this like, give it like two weeks. If you don't absolutely love it in two weeks, hey, I'll remake it for free, no problem. And today I've had none people remake a denture. Like they love it because their family tells them like, oh my gosh, mom, you look so good. This has taken 10, 15 years off your life. You look just like you did back when you were like 50. You know, this looks amazing. And patients love it and they love being fussed over. So, but just again, make sure you, you emphasize to your patients that um, <laughs> they're not gonna recognize themselves right away. All right, this is a this is a next case here. So that was Tran. Um, that was something a little bit different. Again, kind of using more of like a uh, a regional based uh, dentition for her. So Joan, Joan is one of these patients that um, you know when she came in, she has a full complement of teeth. Um, it's not looking really good during her initial presentation. And I know you guys see people like this all the time. And you know their teeth almost looks calico. It's just like you know you look at this and you just think, gosh, where <laughs> where do I even start? You know what I mean? Like, you know, where is like she's had six different dentists in here using 12 different materials, right? And she's got abscesses, she's got recession, sensitivity on her teeth, uh, she's got a lot of wear and tear, right? The teeth are breaking down. Not there's not a single tooth in the mouth. The only thing that's consistent is how inconsistent the color of the teeth is, right? And so Joan at this point is sick and tired of being sick and tired. So by the time she's finally met me, um, she knows she needs a denture. I didn't, this didn't require any, <laughs> any convincing for her to, that she's going to have to get her teeth out. Right. And I could go in here and try to repair every single tooth and it would probably cost, you know, $60,000 to, to crown everything, to do all the caries control, you know, some crown lengthening procedures, some implants, some endo. I mean, it's a ton of stuff. And the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. And honestly, um, her best bet is going to be to get these teeth taken out. Now, this was a photo, um, you know, that I take it from the case that only when I was looking at it, you know, later on, like months later, did I realize kind of what I was looking at and how sort of interesting this was. And this is what I call the reality of time <laughs> and the dental life cycle, right? So if you take a look at the right side of your screen and you've got this kind of like intact tooth, yeah, there's like a little bit of wear, maybe a little bit of staining it on the incisal edge. And that's the, the lateral incisor. That's number uh, 26 there. And you start to move over to the canine now. Now you can see the wear facets on that canine, right? This patient probably had, you know, she probably had like a metal ceramic crown on top that was just just wearing down that canine. But then you take a look at the, the cervical region there and she's getting some of that accumulated bio burden. The tooth is starting to break down, right? Now you go one tooth back and you know, what has happened to that tooth now? That bio burden turned into caries, turned into a restoration, turned into recurrent decay. You can see where the wear facet on top and the back is also like worn down to the dentin. There's been another restoration back there that's filling. You go one step further and that tooth becomes a crown, right? And that crown breaks, uh, gets again, recurrent decay at the margin, probably had a root canal, so they didn't feel it. And then, you know, six, seven years later, they're biting down into an almond and crunch, that whole tooth rolls off. And that's usually the point where the patient walks into my office and says, hey doc, can you, <laughs> can you glue this back on, right? So I just thought that this was kind of an interesting photo that kind of showcased how the how the teeth went in the life cycle there and in the life cycle this is this is the end game right this is the this is the only thing that is permanent in dentistry usually right um if if, if our patients live long enough honestly everything that they have in their mouth will need to be replaced and i hate to say that as a prosthodontist right because i don't want to have to redo my work if i do my job well enough hopefully i won't have to redo many of my patients you know restorations over the lifetime so 
We get all of our teeth out while we're getting the teeth out, right? We're planning this out with the surgeons, of course. Again, I don't do any of the extractions. I don't place any of the implants. So the patient gets um, some bone grafting done. She gets uh, two implants placed. Again, down in like the generally the lateral incisor region. Um, she's had some time. We've submerged these. And now somebody asked me last time about doing immediate load when I'm doing uh, locator cases like this, like overdenture cases. No, I don't do immediate load on them. <laughs> right? I'd usually submerge them um, and let them chill out for a while until the surgeon says, Miles, you're good to go, which is usually somewhere in the range of like, you know, two, two and a half, three months. The lower anterior mandible, as many of you know, that has one of the highest success rates. Um, the bone is so dense. Um, I almost never see implants fail, fail here. Um, so here we are. This is, yeah, somewhere between like two to three months. You know, I've taken these off and you see that nice cuff of healed tissue around there, right? Um, when you guys take, take the healing abutments off, if you see a little bit of bleeding, that's totally okay. Um, sometimes people panic, but that just means that like those little hemidesmosomes are starting to attach um, to the titanium, um, which is a good thing. It means it's healing and they're doing all right. Um, so this is something I just wanted to point out to you guys, um, and I, I do not speak for the company uh, Zermac, they're an Italian company, I don't speak for them at all, but I just wanted to show this because people on Instagram, people on social media ask me all the time, like, what is the alginate material that I use? So this is the alginate material I use, and just for complete transparency, one of the reasons why I use this is because in my office, I mean, I'm a certified dental technician too. I do a lot of my own lab work. And many times I don't have time at the end of the day because I don't have assistance. Um, I don't have anybody that comes in. I do all my own hygiene. I'm kind of like a one man show, right? So I have to pour all of my own impressions and I'm, I'm really under the gun most of the time. So the five and hydrogum five means that after I wrap this up in wet paper towels, stuff it in like a Ziploc bag, I can let it sit there for like five days before I pour it. So on my bench right now, I've got you know, probably like seven or eight casts have been sitting there for, you know, pushing a week and I'll, I'll come in tomorrow and pour those up. Um, so this stuff looks really, really nice. Um, this is the way that the rolls look on this stuff. I really highly recommend you guys start using alginate. It doesn't have to be this alginate. It could be any alginate, but um, alginate final impressions are fantastic for dentures. Um, they work really, really well. Um, kind of getting back to photos and things. This is, uh, this is my uh, behind the scenes. Um, this is how I got these photographs, that pure white background. You guys should know this by now, right? I've got that giant octobox there. That's actually my background. And this, the moisture on this uh, alginate is not saliva. It was a water spray. You saw me spraying that. So my son is showing this with a cell phone. That's right off the camera. That's how these photos look. Um, it's really, really easy to do. Um, you guys should kind of have a better grasp of what that looks like. Same thing with this. It should be kind of obvious how I got this photo, right? Just setting this down on that big octobox. Um, and this, so for Joan, this again is a process record base. If you guys are looking at the, the pink there and being like, wow, that doesn't look like the triad that I use. That's because it's not, it's a process record base. Um, and you can see I've got some yellow wax attached to that, right? So what I'm going to do with Joan is I'm going to try this in. I'm going to moisten um, that record base down a little bit. And that pink that you see there, that's actually acrylic. That's the final denture base. And so when that goes in, I'm really, I just keep waiting to hear that, that suction that goes in there, right? And it's going to be unbelievable. And your patients are going to love it. And when that happens, they will let you do just about anything you want in terms of like setting the teeth and selecting the colors. They will trust you implicitly because dang, you got this thing to stick when nobody else could. Um, now, in regards to while we're talking about like the um the wax rim and setting the teeth on there a lot of people again ask me which teeth do i use or which ones do i think are the best um again i i don't speak for any companies that you know make teeth um these are the teeth that i really like these are uh by this company called polydent in slovenia like again i don't speak for polydent um at all but these are the teeth that i use because i know everybody asks everybody wants to know i just really like these um, for the reason that I mentioned before about setting canine guidance, you see how aggressive and gnarly these canines are. I like teeth that look like teeth. When we were in dental school, you know, maybe you had, um, you know, maybe you had the lingualized occlusion. I know Ivaclar has their blue line teeth, that, which are you know, set for like lingualized occlusion. I just, I generally don't think that most denture teeth look like teeth, which is why I really like these. If you take a look at the topography of these, they're just absolutely gorgeous. It's just gnarly and like, it's got little peaks and valleys and things like that. That's what I like. And that's what I go for. And guess what? To date, 
yeah, every time I set teeth like this, like there's no problems. Like again, patients aren't walking around, even with the resorbed mandibles, I'm not setting like zero degree teeth or anything like that. I know there's a lot of people that do that. And I just, to date, I haven't had any issues setting teeth in a, in a manner where the teeth look like real teeth. Um, so again, I mentioned, you know, as uh, Dennis Urban uh, so kindly mentioned in the beginning here, I, again, I am a certified dental technician. So every now and then I have really good technicians that I work with, but every now and then I like to set my own teeth. And when I do set my own teeth, I always do the front six. Um, many of the denture technicians that I work with, they'll set like the full, full mouth. You know, for me to set six teeth takes me like two hours or something like that. I'm just not that fast with it, right? I try to be like really, really particular about it. So when I set the teeth myself, I usually try um, the front six teeth. And you'll notice that uh, in this case right here, notice the wax is red. Whereas when I showed you the process record base before, it was yellow. <laughs> So a big part of the reason why I had that process record base before is because this was on triad. I didn't like the setup. Um, and when the patient was biting down, this red wax was kind of squishing and stuff. And so my denture technician that I was working with really recommended that I use that yellow wax, which is this wax called, it's called GEBD. It's G-E-B-D-I. And again, I don't speak for GEBD. This is the wax that we really like to use. It's really, really, it's like bullet hard. And so when the patient, if you ever have your patient bite down and it kind of kind of smears all over, you need a different wax. And so there's different um, consistencies of wax. You know, there's like type three, type two. I need a wax that's a little bit harder. Um, so here we are, um, after we've figured out with Joan, like where the teeth are gonna go and what she likes, um, now it's our turn to do uh, the pickups at the chair side. And so when we do these pickups, um, I just wanted to like point this out in case it wasn't obvious. Um, when I was teaching at the dental school, um, I noticed, you know, every time I'd go to do like the, the, the check on the students, many times they wouldn't have these white uh, little silicone rings in there uh, before picking up <laughs> the locator attachments. Just make sure you do that. Otherwise, this could happen. And um, for full transparency, this was actually my case. Um, you know, show of hands, anybody in the audience who's ever had to cut a denture out of a patient's mouth before. <laughs> that is a crappy day. That is not a fun day. Okay, and I'll tell you what, you do that one time and you never do it again. Um, and let me just say, if I'm successful at all, if I do anything at, at a high level, it's only because I failed and fell flat on my face so many times in the past. Okay, so I just want to make that very, very clear. All right, so here we are. Here we are picking these up. Um, and I always have the patient help me out. And again, like I said, it's just me in my practice. Like oftentimes my wife is on the phone or she's out lecturing or writing a paper. She's doing something else. So I have to do this 100% on my own. So this uh, little cheek retractor that the patient has here, this is made by Salvin Dental. Um, there's a ton of different companies that make um, these little cheek retractors. I've got like 50 different ones from 50 different companies. They're all actually pretty good. I've got different size ones for different patients. Joan actually has kind of a big mouth. So I, I use this really big one from Salvin. So she's actually holding onto that and it just pulls her vestibule out of the way and gives me hands-free access um, to putting, you know, this chair side pickup material around all of the attachments. Okay. So what, um, what you see here, um, this is another type of uh, pickup material. So the one that I showed you before is in like a bigger tube. Again, we have a very boutique office, so we have a, a smaller clinic. So I typically don't use uh, pickup material that comes in like bigger, bigger packages. I like these ones that are in these little like syringes that almost looks like, you know, just like the composite that you use. And there's different types. The ones that I typically tend to use, again, as a prosthodontist, I need to move quick. I like to use fast setting um pick up resins um whatever you are comfortable with use that please don't go and use the fast one be like well miles use the fast one and then you get stuck you know I mean? halfway through it's like you're not able to seat it right and speaking of seating um when you finally get to the point after you've picked up um your locator attachments i really really highly recommend that you use the lightest retention possible i know everybody always wants to go to the strongest one because your patient told you that they want to be able to hold on to the the handle bar of like the water skis and like go down the river, right? Like use the lightest retention possible and please, please, please make certain that your patient can actually take it back out at the end of the day, okay? So I, I made this mistake during my residency when I tried when I tried the denture in for the first time, I can still remember, you know, and I was like, yeah, it looks great, you know, all right, I'll see you later. And we high-fived and I got my photographs and she walked out and I never made sure that she could take it out 
and put it back in. And uh, she came back like a week later and she's like, hey, how am I supposed to get this thing out? And I was like, oh my gosh. And her mouth like smelled so bad, you know, cause she's getting like food trapped under it and stuff. So really, really make sure that your patients know how to get these out in and in. in. Um, typically what I'll start about, if you're using like the, the locators that are the legacy, like the gold ones, I start with like the, the pink. The pink is like somewhere that's nice and in the middle. Um, the blue ones are really, really rare. You know, sometimes I use those blue ones if the implants aren't quite like parallel, you know what I mean? Because it does, it's not quite as strong, the retention. Um, maybe once, maybe once in like 15 years have I used like the five pound retention. Um, and that was on like some woman who was like 35 years old, okay? But the truth is most of our patients um, you know, they're now 35 years old and many of them have hands that look like this, right? They've got some pretty gnarly, like rheumatoid arthritis, right? So just please make sure that if your patient's hands do look like this, you start with, you know, like an extended range, like insert, right? The extended range ones are the ones that don't look like a donut. It's just like totally hollow on the inside. There's no like Patrix portion of that that's going to engage into the actual abutment, okay? So um, if you're using the locators, this is usually like the gray or the red, right? The gray one has like no retention. The red has like one pound of retention, right? So just please keep that in mind when you're, when you're looking at your patients. Um, and something else, this is a, a last minute addition I want to put in here. I didn't, I never, never showed this before at my last presentation, um, but I wanted to run this by you guys. This is something that I highly recommend. In my office, every single patient that walks through my door gets bleaching trays and they get 10% carbamide peroxide. And it doesn't matter what company it is. There's like 10 different companies that make uh, a carbamide peroxide. I would highly recommend you do this with your patients though. Um, many of my denture patients are sleeping with their dentures in place. Like their husbands, their wives have no idea that they wear a denture. Um, many of those implants, and again, keep in mind, and I don't wanna be mean, but many of your patients are in a denture for a very specific reason, right? And that reason is, is like they didn't take care of their damn teeth, right? So make sure you do this for your patients, especially the ones that are wearing this all the time. And you'll know, you'll know if they're wearing it. They'll tell you no, but the tissue will be like red in certain areas, right? So what I'll do is I'll give them some of my 10% carbamide peroxide, not 10% hydrogen peroxide, you will barbecue your patients, a 10% carbamide peroxide, and this 10% carbamide peroxide breaks down into a 3% hydrogen peroxide. And I will have them just put that inside the little inserts. And when they pop that in their mouth, that carbamide peroxide is going to irrigate around all of their inserts, okay? Some of your patients that have little exposed threads on their, on their implants, right? That hydrogen peroxide will irrigate and bubble and fizz around that. It will keep it so meticulously clean. It will be absolutely phenomenal. So Again, there is not a single patient in my office, even patients without teeth, they are getting bleaching gel. And this 10% carbamide peroxide, you can get this at the store. So any of you guys that have kids, you might know what this is. If you've ever been to like Walgreens or CVS, they have a product there called glyoxide, right? And it comes in a little box. And so when your little babies, I know when my daughter, um, our first baby had thrush, right? In her mouth, um, we took that glyoxide on a little cotton swab and we'd like wipe it around her mouth. And again, that glyoxide is just a 10% carbamide peroxide, which breaks down into the 3% hydrogen peroxide. And 3% hydrogen peroxide is less than what your body in the eyes, brain, and liver naturally make every day. So the patient can swallow it. They can wear it for eight hours at a time. It's not going to damage the tissue. It's not going to burn. So just a, a little hot tip there. So here's the final result. Here's Joan at the very end. Um, she really loved the way that this looked. She was very, very happy. And, you know, she was so happy. She came back um, you know, a few times for some final photographs at the end here. And, you know, and this is what I call the final photo, um, right? When you look at the before and after for me, I'm like, okay, this is what I really want to see. It's kind of like how far Joan came in the journey, right? Um, what my wife likes to see again, being the practice manager, she says, no, this is the final photo. 
when the patient has a Duchenne smile, when they're smiling with their eyes, she says, I want to see crow's feet. She's like, if I don't see the crow's feet, I know the patient isn't happy. You know, and the patient's up front giggling and laughing and she can't wait to come back. And she's so sad because she's been seeing us like over and over and over, you know, for the last couple months to make this denture. And she's so sad, you know, does she have, will she get a chance to come back to see us? And this is the great opportunity, number one, to ask for, um, you know, your patient to write you a nice review online or to refer their friends. Right, but this is also a good opportunity for you to tell your patients, yes, you need to come back in. You need to come back in. And my recare appointments for my patients typically involve, they're very, very easy. I take their dentures, I put them in the ultrasonic bath, right? I'm polishing, I'm cleaning with the super floss and everything, uh, cotton rolls around all of their implants, around all of the hardware. I'll even take, you know, a profi angle with some pumice and I'll go over, you know, their denture in the grooves. Again, these patients' teeth, they're stain, they're going to stain. It's plastic, right? And especially many of your patients like Joan here who are retired, they're drinking a lot of coffee, a lot of red wine, right? You know, they still have their vices just like we all do. Um, so yeah, encourage them to come back, check the tissue, make sure the denture is fitting appropriately, right? Those teeth are going to wear down over time. And the American College of Prosthodontists, what they recommend is that you replace your patient's dentures every five years. I, I personally don't think that that's realistic. That's, that's a lot of money. You know, if you told me, you know, when you tell me that I had to replace my, when I had glasses before I got LASIK, you know, every like four to five years, you change your prescription. That's normal. But yeah, you know, a pair of glasses is like, 500 bucks or something like that for some contact lens solution, you know, and a few lenses, you know, a denture, new denture is like six, seven grand. Like who's got that? Like who has that kind of money? <laughs> you know, like most, most of my patients don't. So realistically, I tell my patients if they get double digits out of their denture, that's really good. But probably in the, the eight year or so time frame, we really should start thinking about replacing this. And I tell them, you know, at about five or six years, start saving your pennies. Start saving your pennies so that by like maybe like that 10, 11, 12 year mark, that's probably when we're gonna replace it. And that's what we've been doing for most of our patients and it's been working out well. All right, this is Peggy. Um, you know, I say this about every case that, you know, this is like one of my favorite cases. This actually is one of my favorite cases. Peggy is uh, such, a, such a great personality. She's just so nice. Um, and each one of my patients has their own personality, but, um, Peggy, the issue with Peggy is like her, her husband doesn't know that she has a denture. Um, and that's shocking to me because her teeth, the way that her teeth look, it's one thing if he didn't know that she has it, but after we finished it, she said that he still didn't notice, which I'm, <laughs> I'm not really sure how to take that. Um, but let's, let's take a look at Peggy and we'll, we'll kind of get into this. So when, when patients come in again, for the first time, you know, I mentioned in, in trans case, I'm always looking at the, the oral, oral tissue, you know, the bone, right? But the, the aesthetics of this, when they have a denture, now Peggy's denture was made by a prosthodontist to start out with. Um, and it was actually, it was actually pretty good. It actually wasn't done, um, you know, too bad. Um, so what, um, what I wanna do with Peggy is I kinda wanna keep generally the same format that she's got going on. I don't wanna change it too much. Um, you know, so I look at her in repose, I look at her in a postured smile or what I call like a social smile, kind of how she smiles with her friends. And then I do, again, this Duchenne smile, right? And to do, get a Duchenne smile, it's helpful if you talk to patients maybe about their kids or their family. Peggy doesn't have any kids yet, um, you know, but she's a big Wisconsin Badgers fan. So I'll talk to her about, you know, college football or something. And then she really starts smiling, especially if they won, right? So, and I take a look at Peggy, I, I look at her in the profile view, I'm looking at her from all angles, right? And I'm looking really at the lip support here. I wanna see, okay, does her existing denture give her really, really good lip support? And in her case it does, which saves me a lot of time going forward. So when I start to make my record bases, my wax rims, I've got sort of a template already that I can use. Um, so Peggy's got some existing um, legacy locators in place. And, you know, let me just mention one thing again, when we're, since we're talking about like photography so much last time with a lot of my photos, I, you know, it's not just for taking great photos and getting, you know, fire emojis and the, the flexing emojis on, on Instagram, right? There's a big part of these photos that really, you know, draw my attention. And when I was taking these pictures, I didn't notice it until I was looking back at it later on. And I was like, oh, Peggy's got some real gnarly pathology going on here, right? That it would have been easy to miss just doing a typical exam. Because until I started blowing airway and really taking a deep, close look at this, I did not notice 
that she had this like fenestration going from, you know, the, the labial mucosa right to the implant. And I took, you know, taking a look at the radiograph, you can see there's been a little bit of bone loss around there. And I think what's happening is because you can look at Peggy's locators here, they're kind of like off angle. The one on the left side, you can see towards the mesial where it's kind of looking silver there where some of that uh, gold nitride coating has been wiped off, right? So these aren't exactly parallel. And so every time Peggy's taking this on and off, um, it's doing a lot of damage to, to the implant. It's putting undue stress on there. She's also sleeping with it at night. And many women, especially like younger females, tend to carry a lot of stress with them and they do it differently than men do. Um, and so during the night, she's kind of expunging that stress and she's grinding and she's clenching and it's taken its toll on this one implant that's kind of angled forward a little bit more. So with Peggy's case, um, I know I mentioned that I do a lot of my um, final impressions with alginate. In her case, um, I made custom trays and I did the border molding with the modeling plus compression compound and we peel this little wax spacer out of there, right? And again, I use a VPS for her case. Again, I don't do this all the time, um, but I do it some of the time, right? And if I'm gonna make uh, final impressions of some of these um, attachments and these abutments, then you have to use silicone. You can't really use alginate, it just wouldn't work. Um, so here's a, a picture of uh, these little locator impression copings. I always call these like little wine goblets. That's kind of what they look like. Um, you'll notice that Peggy's tissue here has been significantly improved in terms of the oral health, right? Um, again, this comes from giving her some of that bleaching gel. She's wearing that bleaching gel and now the tissue isn't all pebbly. It's healed really fast. Um, she's doing great. Um, so here's the way that these locators look in place, right? The analogs. And again, you can tell they're kind of like, like wonky. So again, every time she bites down, she's putting stress on these, um, which is not, <laughs> not really outstanding. That's not really what you want to see. Um, also, the attachments that she has in her denture are like really, really tall. So I want to kind of shorten those up a little bit. All right. So when the um, record bases and wax rims come back from the lab, again, I'm having the patient I'm putting her in a postured smile. And then... <laughs> Yeah, I, I always joke. I, you know, I, I always joke that I tell the patient like a dirty joke. I usually don't. Like usually I'll, I'll walk into the lab or I'll walk into the office, the operatory with like a wig on or something and I'll get the patient to laugh and they'll think it's so funny. And I've got my camera ready and I like, I, I take the picture like right away because normally the patient wouldn't laugh like this, right? Normally they don't laugh like that. Usually when you tell the patient to smile, this is sort of what they look like. Right. So from, you know, getting Pe Peggy to laugh or sometimes what I'll tell the patient is I'll say, say E, say the letter E and they'll say E. Right. And so that's how we'll get. Well, that's how we'll get them to get that high smile line. And then I'll score it on there um, with a little uh, explorer or something like that. So when I'm doing my centric jaw relation records, again, you want to make some little indexing grooves and you want to make sure that they're, they form a tripod. And so the tripod comes from the right bite registration, the left bite registration, and then you need some anterior contact right in the front, um, right? Because that's going to hold your vertical. You don't want a gap there. And you also notice I didn't do the bite registration 360 degrees or what, 180, whatever, all the way around. You don't want to cover the whole arch. Right. And what you should see with the bite registration material is a little bit of burn through. That's how you know that the wax in the front is making contact. That's sort of your the canary in the coal mine there. All right. So remember I talked to you guys before about, hey, if you're doing this uh, processed record base and maybe you missed a key part of the anatomy. Right. This process record base. This is what I was saying. Sometimes when I do these process record bases like I did for Peggy when I tried it in it didn't have the suction that I really wanted. It was really kind of a bummer. So I ended up having to paint the tray. That's what that blue adhesive is. So now, and the patient has no idea. So I painted that tray and then I now, with some tray adhesive, I now have the world's most customized form fitting um, denture tray, custom tray. So then I just put a little wash in there, a little VPS wash. And now I pick up all that impression material. And you can see there's a little burn through there. That's fine. And that's what you'd expect because this is already a very intimate uh, fitting tray. So now I guarantee if you miss that hamular notch, you missed a little part of the vestibule, something on the palate, you will definitely pick it up on this go around. All right. So when this goes off to the laboratory, we get our aesthetic try-in back, right? And again, my, my technician is so good. He's doing the full, he's doing the full mouth setup for this. Um, and he's got everything, you know, checking all the boxes here, making sure that we've got good opacity on these teeth because Peggy's old teeth were so bright white. They just looked so fakey. 
right? But texture, texture is a big one. Many denture teeth just don't have really, really good texture. And then the shade and the form is also going to be really, really key. So we just want to give Peggy something that when she walks into the room, like nobody knows that it's fake teeth, right? It needs to suit her face. It needs to suit her personality. So this is a B1 tooth. I mean, this is still pretty bright. Her old teeth were really square and they were like something in the range of like an OM2 and they were just like toilet bowl color, right? They were just absolutely awful. And so again, I'm just viewing this from all vantage points, looking at it from all angles. And of course now Peggy, now she likes the way it looks. Now she's got jokes, right? Now she's making all kinds of funny faces at me when I tell her to smile, right? It's a totally different situation now when she sees like, okay, this is gonna look good. You know, the patients are kind of worried up until that point. Right. And then when we get the final denture and we try it in again, I'm going through um, sort of like the resting smile, the social smile, and then like the full smile that says, like, hey, man, I just got some new teeth from Miles Cohn. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And this is how that looks. Um, the patient was very, very happy in the end. Here's the final prosthesis. That's the way that it looks. And again, and I'm just evaluating all the borders to make sure everything's nice and smooth right? Looking at the intaglio surface, the cameo surface. And by the way, it's intaglio surface. A lot of people say intaglio, the G is silent. Again, if you get nothing else from this presentation, it's intaglio, right? Um, and so there's Peggy at the, the very, very end. She was really, really happy with that. Very, very satisfied with the final result. Here's a little behind the scenes. And I, for whatever reason, guys, I don't know why taking photos of dentures is always kind of difficult. I don't know. The patients can't like it's always like dark corridors and things like that. It's very difficult for me to get like really nice internal photos sometimes of dentures, but that's one of the tips that I use. Um, so here was her before again. Uh, yeah, just didn't look really great. And here's how she left um, the office that day. And again, it's like funny because I'm like, all right, so you left your house at 8 a.m. looking like you did on the left here. When you returned at night, you looked that way. Your husband didn't say nothing. Like, I don't know. So um, kind of curious. <laughs> Um, all right. So guys, thanks for sticking around. We're going to go through our final case here. Um, this is Ron. And I think I saved the best for last. This is my, definitely my favorite, um, my favorite case. Um, so Ron came in and Ron was also treated by a prosthodontist. And so I just want to say this too, for you guys that have seen my other presentations, like just because somebody's a prosthodontist does not mean that they can make a denture or prep a tooth any better um, than somebody that's like a comprehensive dentist or a general dentist like that's not that's not true at all and if you guys want more proof of that let me know i'll send you photos of what prosthodontists have done um, i'll send you some of my work i'll send you some of the stuff that a prosthodontist and a cdt has done you'll see um so ron's got some really poor aesthetics some really poor you know function going on so this is you know i love these cases when it's poor aesthetics and poor function because it gives me a chance to kill two birds with one stone you know, his existing denture is just falling apart. It's been relined like 25 times, right? And when we reline these dentures, um, I always do this technique where I will make like a jig. This is the only time that I'll do like a full arch bite registration jig. And I will do this in place so that I can maintain um, like a home base because after you've carved out the old reline material, right? The denture isn't gonna fit. It's gonna slosh around from side to side and all over, right? So I always do that before I start carving out um all the old reline material right and i usually do this complimentary for my patients when they first come in you know again they're not happy with the process they've already paid a lot of money for an, uh, for an existing denture and now i need to like win them over and get them on board um so when you're fine tuning this um you guys are going to have a lot of burn through especially if this is like an immediate denture um, which was the case for ron you're going to see these areas that are burning through don't worry about it it's okay because when you do this reline you're going to reestablish that suction again all right um and when you do the maxillin mandible this question always comes up you know when you're doing both at the same time which one do you do first do you do the maxilla or do you do the mandible first and the answer is is you do the mandible first and the reason why you reline the mandible first is because the maxilla is usually the most stable right and again think about what i said before most of your patients that walk in that have existing dentures many of them will wear the maxillary arch and what do they always say? The mandible never fits. And they're lucky if they even have it, right? So always do the mandible first. So this is the way um, that this reline looks, right? It's ready to polish. I always recommend holding um, your little Brillo pad there about a 90 degree angle to the margin. And then it's really nice if you can seal the margins. Um, there's many different companies that make little resins um, that you can use to kind of seal the margins up. It helps keep bacteria at bay keeps a really nice, uh, seamless sort of look. Patients love it. Tends to last longer. You don't have to redo your, your um, relines as much. 
And when I do these relines for patients that have had immediate dentures, I'm usually doing them twice a year. Um, and this is something I just want to mention too, that doing relines, I know a lot of people are getting in digital dentures. Digital dentures are great, but relining dentures, you know, these analog skills, this is something that you're still going to have to know how to do going into the future. Cause right now we can't print out like a silicone reline yet. Okay. Um, so with Ron's case, we reset his teeth. We made a whole totally new setup from the lower. And again, we did, we went very low tech with this, right? Um, we, where we wanted to put the implants, we just made a radiographic um, guide with some barium sulfate in there, carved out the area where we wanted the implants to go. For Ron's case, he only had bone in the canine region. I said before, it's usually great if you can get it in the laterals. Ron only had bone in the canine region. He lost a lot of bone here, I guess, when they were taking the teeth out and he had some radiation therapy. So, um, so here's where we have our uh, locator abutments placed. Um, I'm using this uh, driver. And um, one of the things I do want to point out is this pink anodized housing. Um, so Zest has these really nice um, uh, new locator housings. And one of the things about these that's really, really nice, and you'll see there's a lot of like implant companies that are coming out um, with this technique too, where like the head of the implant has been anodized pink. If you guys have ever seen dentures, I'm sure you have. This is like every other day in my office, somebody walks in with a denture like this, where you can see that titanium or that stainless steel like showing through the acrylic right so if you use um, a housing um, on one of these some of these attachments that kind of matches the pink it'll really tend to blend in a little bit more all right so here we are um, doing the final impressions and again i like these massad denture trays um, zest makes one ivoclar makes one there's a lot of companies that make these different denture trays but i really really highly recommend you get these What's nice about um, the ones that Zest makes is you can put them in a denture bath and heat them up. And now you can take that and put it in the patient's mouth and kind of mold it. So you have almost like a semi-fitted um, stock tray, which is actually really, really nice. And you get these just gorgeous borders with this. Um, so again, if you guys aren't using Algin now, I really, really highly recommend you try using this Algin. And so with Ron, um, again, we're marking the midline, doing the high smile line. Sometimes that's tough with a beard <laughs> mustache there. Um, and we're marking the canine. Again, this is like some very, very low tech stuff, you guys. I know a lot of people want to do like the digital smile design and all this stuff. I use like really low techy stuff and it seems to work for me. And you can see all the aesthetic factors kind of marked on here, that high smile line along with the midline. Of course, I've got, this is tripoded out. It's contacting in the interior and I've got the bite registration on the left and right. Um, so something, sometimes patients like Ron don't have a lot of money, you guys. And so if you're doing a process record base, your lab is going to charge you an extra like, you know, 70 bucks or something to do a process record base. And again, I only do it on the top. The reason I only ever do it on the top is because if I have a patient that's got two implants on the bottom, you notice in Ron's lower denture here, I've got um, some of those pickup attachments on there. That's just going to click right over um, his existing abutments that are on there. So I don't need to have a super form fitting uh, mandibular denture base. I really only need it for the maxilla. But now that cost, I have to, I have to pass on to the patient. So if I'm trying to save the patient some money, something that I can do is I will take like some dry mouth gel in lieu of denture adhesive, and I will just extrude that into the denture. This is kind of like the poor man's process record base. And when that goes in, this washes out super easy, not like denture adhesive, and it sticks, it tastes nice. And for patients like Ron, we were using this uh, dry mouth gel for him again, because he had a lot of radiation therapy, he gets such dry mouth. And so this serves as a dual function uh, for him. So here's the final restoration. Um, when I'm doing this again, the only time I'm ever making a full arch bite registration like that is when I need to like either pick up the attachments in the mouth or if I'm relining this thing. But when I'm sending this to the laboratory, again, I only do it just left and right. Less is more. Um, and so when we are going to pick these up, we use, um, there's a lot of different burrs that we can use. Um, and like Zest makes a special like locator recess burr, which is really, really good. Um, something that is missed oftentimes by many dentists is they forget to put vent holes in the back, right? So when you've got the recesses in the lower denture, make sure you like pop a couple holes through the back side there so that when you seat the denture, all of the resin has a place to flow out. Um, it'll be so much better. You'll be so thankful that you did. So that's the way that it looks from the other side. So I just pop a hole back and I usually do it through the lingual. I do not do it through the facial aspect. And also much of the resin that you'll use for these dentures, it, it does not adhere to the acrylic, right? It's just kind of mechanical. So you need to create mechanical retention in these dentures with, with an undercut burr.
All right. And then, you know, obviously there's going to be a tool to put this in. Um, Zest has a new tool. They've made it dentist proof, right? It says in and out on there in case you can't read, right? Um, they made it super easy. Um, so you can see here, I'm putting that uh, locator housing in there, um, the attachment, the nylon housing um, to insert that. Uh, and here's Ron at the very, very end. Um, so one thing I do want to point out that somebody mentioned one time, they're like, hey, bro, like his teeth are Ron, his teeth like really bright. I mean, they like are brighter than his beard, <laughs> like legit. I said, yeah, you know what, man? Like Ron survived cancer. He, this is my one time where I did not try to convince the patient to get, you know, like an A3 shade tooth. I said, you know what? I said, Ron, you tell me which color you like. And he showed me the whitest thing on there. I said, you got it, man. You had you had a brain tumor and you you survived it and you've been through hell and back so you can get whatever color you want and ron was very very happy with that you can see in that middle photo where he's really smiling with his eyes he was just over the moon with the way that this looked so guys thank you so much that was just you know some rapid fire cases and hopefully now you guys know how i took this photo based on how from what i showed you that first time around i hope you guys had a lot of fun hanging out with me i know i've had a lot of fun uh presenting this um, for those of you that had asked last time, here is my equipment list. Um, I have a kit. Um, and if you guys go check out kit, I guess it's like kit.com or something and just look up at Miles Cone DMD. I don't get any, oh, and here's the, yeah, here's the webpage at the bottom. If you guys go to that, that will have all the gear that I used from that first presentation. I don't get any kickbacks from this stuff. I just made this as a nice handy dandy list so you guys can see exactly what I use. Um, and again, if you guys still have questions, um, please feel free to check out my website, um, my depth of field website. I've got a lot of publications on there that I've written um, that are free for you guys to download. If you want to see more information about how I did some of the photography, some more stuff about how I do some of the dentures, right? There's a lot of great information out there and it's free for you guys to download uh, anytime you want. So again, I just want to thank NDX um, Education. Thank you to Zest. Thank you to everybody who stopped out. You are. Thank Good you very, very much. And I'll take any questions you guys might have.